Welcome to this RSET online session. I am Dr. Ringu Jacob from the Department of Basic Sciences and Humanities, Rajagiri School of Engineering and Technology. The topic of my lecture for today is quantum mechanics and this is the first part of my lecture series on this topic. This topic is from the first part of module 3 in the engineering physics syllabus for first year engineering students of circuit branch as per the KTU syllabus 2019. These are the topics I plan to discuss in this session. These are some of the questions taken from the previous university question paper related to the topic quantum mechanics. First we see why do we need quantum mechanics. The classical physics works fine to explain behavior of large objects but it fails to explain the behavior of atoms and subatomic particles. Say for example if you take a semiconductor material its properties are governed by behavior of electrons in crystal lattice and this can be clearly explained using quantum mechanics. For everyday objects much larger and much more massive than atoms and much slower than the speed of light, classical physics works fine. In 1924, de Broglie formulated the de Broglie hypothesis which claimed that all matter have a wave-like nature. He related the particle nature which is the momentum of the particle with that of the wave nature of the particle that is the wavelength associated with the particle when it behaves as a wave by a formula which is given by lambda equal to h by p that is h is the Planck's constant and p is the momentum of the particle. The de Broglie formula was confirmed three years later for the electrons with the observation of the electron diffraction in two independent experiments. The de Broglie was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1929 for his hypothesis. Thomson and Davison shared the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1937 for their experimental work which proved the de Broglie hypothesis. The wave-particle duality is the concept in quantum mechanics that every particle may be described as either a particle or a wave. Now for a comparison of the size of matter wave for large object and subatomic size particles, we first calculate wavelength of a ball of mass 100 gram that is moving with a speed of 10 meter per second. So using the de Broglie wavelength equation, lambda equal to h by mv, we get 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 34 meter as the wavelength of the matter wave associated with the ball. The size of this wave is very small. Now we try to calculate the wavelength of the matter wave associated with an electron that is moving with a speed of 10 to the power 7 meter per second. Here we get 7.28 into 10 to the power minus 11 meter. This wavelength is comparable to the dimensions of atoms. From this comparison, it is clear that the wave aspects of atomic and subatomic particles like electrons, neutrons and protons etc. cannot be ignored. So a new mechanics which incorporates both particle and wave aspects was introduced to explain many phenomena that could not be explained based on classical theory. Next we discuss about wave function. In quantum mechanics, wave function is a mathematical function which describes the state of a particle or a system. As the particle is treated as a wave, the motion of the particle is seen as the motion of the wave in place of the particle. So in order to study the propagation of this wave, we have to use a mathematical function for this wave whose variables are position and time. So the wave function should be a function of position coordinates and time. It should be a complex function and this wave function is denoted by psi. Now we look on the physical meaning of the wave function. The wave function at a particular time contains all the information about the particle at the given time. But the wave function itself have no physical interpretation. Wave function is a complex function and it cannot be directly measured. But the product of complex conjugate of the wave function which is denoted by psi star and the wave function psi itself is interpreted as the probability density or the probability of finding the particle in a unit length if the particle is moving in one dimension. It is also written as the square of the modulus of the wave function that is psi square. Now we discuss about a mathematical procedure in quantum mechanics called as normalization of a wave function. We have already discussed earlier that psi star multiplied by psi is the probability density or the probability of finding the particle in a unit length. So before we make any study about the particle, first we should make sure that the wave function representing the matter wave for the particle clearly shows the information about the particle at each point. So if we say that the particle exists in a given region of space, say x axis between x equal to 0 and x equal to 1, then when we check for the probability density of the particle between x equal to 0 and x equal to 1, then we should get a value between 0 and 1 in this range. But if we check for the probability density outside this range, it should definitely give 0 as the particle is not existing outside this range. So when we sum up all the probability density of the particle between the range x equal to 0 and x equal to 1, we should get unity. 
that means the probability of finding the particle within the range x equal to 0 and x equal to 1 is different at different points inside it but surely the particle is within this range now if we replace the summation with integration we get integral psi star psi dx equal to 1 if we take three dimensional space then the normalization equation or the normalization condition is given as integral psi star psi d tau equal to 1 where d tau is the volume element now we see how to write the wave function of a particle in terms of energy and momentum we know energy and momentum are physical quantities associated with a particle and frequency and wavelength are the physical quantities that are associated with a wave so when we treat a particle as a wave in quantum mechanics the wave function should take the particle nature that is the energy and momentum as the input and the output of the wave function should be the wave nature let us consider a particle moving forward in the x direction let the energy of the particle be e and momentum be p the displacement of a wave can be written as a sin omega t minus kx or a cos omega t minus kx or in general a exponential minus i omega t minus kx where omega is the angular frequency given by 2 pi by t that is the time period and k is the wave vector given by 2 pi by lambda so omega and k are the quantities which describes a wave now in order to use this equation to represent a wave associated with this particle we have to write omega and k in terms of the quantities that is associated with the particle nature that is in terms of energy and momentum First of all, we try to connect the quantity omega which represents the wave nature to the quantity energy that represents the particle nature. For that, we take omega equal to 2 pi by t. But 1 by t is frequency nu. Now multiplying and dividing with Planck's constant h, we get. We know the energy associated with a packet having frequency nu is equal to h nu. So the above equation becomes omega equal to 2 pi e by h. The equation can be written as 1 by h by 2 pi into e and finally omega equal to e by h cross where h cross equal to h by 2 pi now we try to connect the quantity wave vector k that represents the wave nature with the quantity momentum p that represents the particle nature for that we take k equal to 2 pi by lambda but here lambda is the wavelength of the matter wave so we use the de broglie equation that gives the wavelength of the matter wave that is lambda equal to h by p so the above equation becomes k equal to 2 pi by h by p or k equal to 2 pi p by h. The equation can be written as k equal to p by h by 2 pi. And finally, wave vector k equal to p by h cross where h cross equal to h by 2 pi. So we get two transformation equations that connect wave and particle nature. If we take omega equal to e by h cross, the LHS is representing the wave nature and the RHS shows the particle nature. Similarly, the equation k equal to p by h cross. The LHS is showing the wave nature and RHS shows the particle nature. So we can also write e equal to h cross omega and p is equal to h cross k. Now using the value of omega and wave vector k in equation 1, we get the wave function psi equal to a exponential minus i e by h cross into t minus p by h cross into x. Now by taking h cross as common, we get the wave function psi equal to a exponential minus i by h cross into e t minus p x. This is the desired wave function of a particle in terms of the particle nature that is in terms of energy e and momentum p. Next we discuss about the uncertainty principle formulated by Heisenberg in 1927. The uncertainty principle came because of the wave nature of the particles. First we see the uncertainty relation between the position and momentum of a particle. The principle states that it is impossible to measure both exact position and exact momentum of a particle at the same time. If one tried to measure these two canonical conjugate pairs, then the product of uncertainty in the measurement of position that is delta x and the uncertainty in the measurement of momentum that is delta p is equal to or greater than h cross by 2. Next we see the uncertainty relation between the angular position and angular momentum of a rotating particle. The principle states that it is impossible to measure both exact angular position theta and exact angular momentum j of a particle at the same time. If one try to measure these two canonical conjugate pairs simultaneously, 
then the product of uncertainty in the measurement of angular position that is delta theta and the uncertainty in the measurement of angular momentum that is delta j is equal to or greater than h cross by 2. Now we see the third uncertainty relation between energy and time. The principle states that it is impossible to measure both energy E and time T of a particle at the same time. If one try to measure these two canonical conjugate pairs simultaneously, then the product of the uncertainty in the measurement of energy that is delta E and uncertainty in the measurement of time that is delta T is equal to or greater than H cross by 2. Now we move on to the applications of uncertainty principle. The first important application of the uncertainty principle is that it proves the non-existence of electrons inside a nucleus. To prove that, first we take a nucleus as shown in the figure to the right. The size of the nucleus is of the order of 10 raised to minus 14 meter. The yellow spot inside the nucleus is an electron. So we assume that the electron is existing inside the nucleus. It means the wave function is spreading within the nucleus in a range of 10 raised to minus 14 meter. That is in the size of the nucleus. Now when we try to observe the electron that exists inside the nucleus, there is an uncertainty in the measurement of its position due to its wave nature. So we write uncertainty in the measurement of position to be as 10 raised to minus 14 meter. That is delta x equal to 10 raised to minus 14 meter. Now we calculate what will be the uncertainty in the measurement of momentum when we simultaneously measure momentum with position. For that we make use of the uncertainty relation between conjugate pairs of position and momentum. Here we take the minimum condition that is delta x into delta p is equal to h by 2 pi. Now by giving the values of Planck's constant h and delta x into the equation, we get the corresponding uncertainty in the measurement of momentum p as 1.1 into 10 to the power minus 20 kilogram meter per second. Now using the calculated momentum, we try to calculate the corresponding energy of the electron inside the nucleus. For that, we make use of the relativistic kinetic energy expression given by Einstein. That is E is equal to mc square. We can write mc square as mc into c, where mc is the momentum p. So E equal to p into c. Now using the value of p calculated, that is 1.1 into 10 raised to minus 20, and the speed of light c equal to 3 into 10 raised to 8, we get the energy possessed by the electron inside the nucleus to be 3.3 .3 into 10 raised to minus 12 joule. Now we convert the energy of electron in joules to electron volt units. For that we divide the energy in joules with the basic unit of charge that is E and its value is 1.6 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb. So we get 20.625 into 10 raised to 6 electron volt or we can approximate that E is equal to 20 MeV that is 20 million electron volt. So according to uncertainty principle for an electron to exist inside the nucleus the electron must have at least an energy of 20 million electron volt. But experiments indicate that the electrons associated even with unstable atoms, that is atoms showing radioactivity, never have more than a fraction of this energy. So the uncertainty principle proves that electrons cannot present within the nucleus. The second application of uncertainty relation is the natural line broadening in the spectrum of any light source. To understand this, consider a light source emitting light. The emission of the photon occurs when an electron moves down from a high energy level, say E1, to a low energy level E0. The energy of the emitted photon is equal to the difference in energy between the two levels. So when we take the spectrum of this light, we are expecting to get a sharp line at a particular wavelength. But in real situations, instead of getting a sharp spectrum, there is a spread in the line. This is caused by different factors. But one mechanism for this spread is a natural line broadening. In natural line broadening, a spectral line extends over a range of frequencies, not a single frequency, and that is shown in the figure. In addition, its center may be shifted from its normal central wavelength. The natural line broadening mechanism can be explained using uncertainty principle. We have the uncertainty relation between the conjugate pairs energy and time. So according to this principle, an atom that stays for a short time in an excited state will have an uncertainty in time delta t. Here it is the lifetime of the atom in the excited level. Normally the lifetime of this atom is around 10 raised to minus 8 seconds. So when the uncertainty in time decreases, there will be an increase in the uncertainty in the measurement of energy delta e. This will increase the uncertainty in the measurement of frequency. It means when we measure the frequency of a particular photon, we see it to be as not as a single frequency, 
there is a range of frequencies in the spectral analysis which we call as line broadening as this is the natural phenomenon it is called as natural line broadening thus uncertainty principle explain the natural line broadening mechanism this is the end of part 1 thank you for watching this rset online video session on the topic quantum mechanics for more lectures please visit the link shown below